The 2014 Florida Legislative Session begins March 4th. Tonight, the Northwest Florida Legislative Delegation is on set and ready for your questions. We are live and interactive on television and on radio. Legislative Review Dialogue with the Delegation is straight ahead. This original WSRE presentation is made possible by viewers like you. Thank you. And a very pleasant good evening, everyone. I'm Jeff Weeks. Thank you for joining us. In addition to our television broadcast on WSRE, our program is being simulcast on News Radio 1620. This year is likely to bring about a budget surplus for the Sunshine State. The question is, how will that surplus be used? Tax cuts or additional spending? Other issues include whether Florida's gambling laws need changing, the expansion of Medicaid, state pension reform, and citizens' property insurance. You can also expect much debate on education and government accountability. By the way, it's an election year, which should add a little extra excitement to this year's session. Tonight, you're invited to join the discussion. We want your questions, either by email, phone, or Facebook. You can call in and ask your questions off the air at 850-484-1223 or toll free at 1-800-239-WSRE. You can email questions to questions at WSRE.org or submit your questions via the WSRE Facebook page. Our panel this evening, the Northwest Florida Legislative Delegation, led by the man the Pensacola News Journal named the Person of the Year in 2013, Senate President Don Gates, who will enter his second and final year as President of the Florida Senate. He represents one of, uh, I should say he represents District 1, which includes Bay, Holmes, Jackson, Washington, and parts of Okaloosa counties. From the Florida House of Representatives, Matt Gates, whose District 4 covers part of Okaloosa County. Clay Ingram represents District 1, which includes parts of Escambia County. From District 2, we welcome a political newcomer, Representative Mike Hill, who was chosen in a special election last year following the death of Clay Ford. District 2 covers parts of Escambia and Santa Rosa counties. Gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us. Welcome. We're already off to a very robust start with many uh, questions coming in from our viewers, so it should be an interesting evening. Senate President Don Gates, let me begin with you. What's on the top of your list as we head to the 2014 session? Jeff, I think your intro indicated several of the issues that are critical. One is that Speaker Weatherford and I stand with Governor Scott. We want to do a $500 million tax and fee cut to leave more money in the pockets of working Floridians. We want it to be broad-based and target lower-income and middle-income people. Secondly, we want to build a pathway out of poverty uh, through education that leads to jobs, particularly career technical education. Then third, a GI Bill of Rights to help make Florida the, uh, the welcome home state in the United States for the military. Uh, then uh, maintaining a strong and vigilant uh, view towards sexual predators, uh, trying to protect the most vulnerable in our society, including the elderly. And then finally, as you mentioned in your intro, more government accountability, bearing down more on ethics in government, applying the landmark ethics law that we passed last year to local government. Let me start with tax cuts. You mentioned you want it to be broad-based. Where might we see those cuts? Speaker Weatherford and I have already agreed to, uh, to push for a, a rollback in the tag and title fees that apply to vehicles. Uh, right now, uh, our tag and title fees, I think, are too high. And they affect everybody who drives to school and to work. And so we want to reduce those fees considerably by uh, two or three or four hundred million dollars and return that money to people who uh, who drive to work, who drive to school, and that's just about everybody in our society. Let me go across the panel here and sort of get everyone's idea of what's important to them in the 2014 session, and I'll follow up here with you, uh, Representative uh, Ingram. 
Yeah. What's on What's on your list? First of all, I want to thank you, Jeff, and, and Pensacola State College for hosting us and allowing us to have this dialogue with our constituents that that uh, only uh, with this modern technology, uh, you know, it allows us to have. Uh, secondly, we just came through a very significant weather event, uh, and since we have this opportunity to, to uh, thank uh, all of the first responders, uh, the, the EMS workers, uh, and, and uh, police and fire uh, fighters that uh, really did an outstanding job, the, the linemen for, for Gulf Power and the power companies, uh, they did an outstanding job. And I, to, we had this opportunity to thank them publicly. I wanted to make sure to do that. Uh, and so taking a step back, uh, you know, I feel like the panhandle is, is uh, in such good shape now going into this legislative session. Uh, we've mentioned this uh, previously, but President Gates, we're sort of winners uh, before we even get into the session because of the transportation dollars that will come here. Uh, the Three Mile Bridge, you know, the, the proposal was to, to toll the Three Mile Bridge. Uh, that's no longer on the table, uh, thanks to a nearly a, a billion dollar uh, infusion uh, into the transportation sector, into the panhandle. And so we're winners going in. And now we have this, this wonderful uh, collaboration between the House and Senate with the, the Florida work plan uh, that the, the Speaker and the Senate President have agreed on. And so I'm excited to get started on that. There's so many good things, everything that the Senate President mentioned, uh, along with some of the things like creating a, a state technology uh, infrastructure. Uh, we're one of the only states, probably the only state in the country without a chief information officer to uh, uh, make those decisions as a state purchases technology uh, and makes technology decisions. And so uh, some of those things are, are going to be uh, very big, N not the uh, some of the ex most exciting things to talk about, but, but very big uh, and, and very important for the state of Florida. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the weather. Kind of funny, I saw an email come across my desk today and a line I never thought I would see. Someone mentioned the fact that they were stranded in an ice storm on Pensacola Beach. Not something you often <laughs> hear, but I thought I would share that. Everyone can relate to that. Uh, Representative Gates, what's on the, the top of your agenda as we head to 2014? Well, Jeff, I chair the Criminal Justice Subcommittee in the Florida House, and so I try to work each, each session to make sure that our streets are safe and that our communities are strong. In the last 10 years, I've been very troubled to learn that in Florida we've released about 500 violent sexual predators into our communities who have reoffended. I think that's a travesty. And so uh, I'm working with Senator Evers, my counterpart in the Florida Senate, to craft wide, a wide range of legislative proposals to ensure that when we identify someone as a violent sexual predator, that they do not see the light of day again with an opportunity to hurt anyone else. And so we're going to ensure that there are 50 year mandatory minimums for people who commit violent sexual offenses against the developmentally disabled children and seniors, particularly vulnerable populations. And then where there are cases where our state attorneys and law enforcement officers know that someone uh, has these tendencies based on their prior offenses, that we refer them for a very thorough analysis to ensure that, uh, that they in fact ought to be in the community as opposed to behind bars. But a lot more violent sexual predators are going to be behind bars uh, if I have my way. Uh, also, all gun rights issues come to the Criminal Justice Subcommittee, and I'm going to make sure that we don't move one comma in Florida's Stand Your Ground law. The Stand Your Ground law has worked well in our state. We have a 42-year crime low because we're trusting our citizens to take more accountability over their own personal safety, and uh, I want to make sure that we protect the Second Amendment and protect those rights of Floridians. All right. Representative Mike Hill, welcome aboard. Well, thank you, Jeff. Congratulations uh, on your new position. What are you most excited about? Well, I'm excited and honored to be the sponsor of the House bill that Senate Pre President Gates was talking about that's going to be rolling back those fees for the driver's license and license plate renewals. Um, that's going to affect everyone that drives in Florida <clears throat> and give us all an immediate pay raise. So I I'm honored to be the sponsor of that bill. Um, I'm also just honored to be a part of this legislative delegation. Um, we have a conservative um, delegation across the panhandle, and we have seen in Florida that that conservative type of leadership coming from Governor Scott, um, Senate President Gates, and Speaker Weatherford, what that can do to a state, that we can turn it around from a time when it was operating at a deficit, when unemployment was over 11 percent, to now we're at a position where we have a budget surplus, we're giving money back to the taxpayers, we're funding education, and unemployment is below the national average at 6.1 percent. So it's an honor for me to be a part of a delegation that moves Florida in that direction. Well, I remember we had this conversation a couple of years ago, and that was the big concern, what was going on with the economy. And in fact, we are going to have a surplus, it would appear, this year. Uh, 
Senator Gates, how much of a surplus? Do you have a rough idea what we might be that looking at? That number changes, Jeff, uh, as the revenue estimators begin to look at the economy and what's happening. Uh, right now, it looks like it might be in the magnitude of $900 million or thereabouts. Uh, it could grow a little bit. It could shrink a little bit. But uh, as Representative Hill says, uh, the gr exciting thing about this uh, legislative session in terms of taxes is that the government will be able to take care of the critical needs of the state of Florida and return money to the people who've earned it because, you know, we extract that money involuntarily from the cash registers and pockets of the people of this state. And we want to make sure that uh, we don't take a dime more than we need and that we return all that we can. All right. I know a lot of folks will be excited about that. By the way, if you have a question, you can email us, questions at uh, wsre.org, or call 850-484-1223, or at uh, toll-free, 1-800-239-WSRE. And, of course, we also have Facebook uh, up and running. And uh, if you'd like to submit a question via the WSRE Facebook page, you can do that as well. One of the hot topic issues, and I'm going to throw this up for all of you to chime in here, is Medicaid expansion. And uh, one of our viewers is is asking the question, uh, simply put, Medicaid expansion, if the federal government will pay 100% for the first several years, why will Florida not expand Medicaid? Well, Jeff, I don't grant the premise of the question that the federal government can be relied upon in a long-term way to meet the critical needs of Floridians. Now, I'm one of the members of the Florida House. I know Representative Ingram and Representative Hill share the view that expanding Medicaid by using federal money when we don't know what the strings will be that will be attached, when we don't know the sustainability of that source long term, I mean, heck, we know that all that money is, is functionally being borrowed from China right now, and it just doesn't seem like a responsible decision. What we would prefer is to build a patient-centered approach to health insurance in our state. I mean, if you look on TV any time, about every 90 seconds there's a commercial for auto insurance or health or, or life insurance or uh, those types of, because those forms of insurance empower the consumer to pick what they can afford and what they really need. But health insurance is all tied to who your employer is. And that's really what's got to shift. We've got to find innovative ways to empower the consumer to choose what they can afford and what they really need. You know, I probably don't need obstetrics care, but other people would. And so that type of an a la carte approach is, is an approach that is sustainable and that puts the power in the hands of Floridians, not the federal government. Anyone else like to add to that? I have a problem, Jeff, just with the, the, the premise of expanding a broken program. I mean, Medicaid's mm -hmm. been you know rife with fraud uh, for as long as I've been around. And uh, to expand that program, I think, would just be a mistake. Uh, and then, as Representative Gates said, uh, you know, how much can you rely on the, the word of the federal government? I think they've proven to, to be unreliable. And obviously, we've received several questions regarding that. So let me do a, a follow-up that, that a viewer had also submitted. Well, what would the plan be to take care of the poor in our state who, and, and the, the poor, unhealthy, and elderly? Well, the Senate last year passed a plan sponsored by Senator Negron. In fact, we passed it twice. And the plan would have eliminated Medicaid as we know it and instead provide premium assistance to people who could not afford health insurance and allow them to buy in the private market, as Representative Gates said, to choose in the private market a plan that meets their needs, not a plan that meets the government's needs. And we asked the federal government, could we do this? Uh, I asked Secretary Sebelius, uh, could we make sure that if somebody is morbidly obese, that if they want their friends and neighbors to pay for their health care or help them with premium assistance, that they be on a medically directed weight loss program. We asked, is it possible if we've got somebody who's an alcoholic or a drug addict and wants their friends and neighbors, the taxpayers, to pay for premium assistance for them to get health care, that, uh, that we'd be able to say, gosh, you at least have to get some drug or alcohol rehab or quit smoking if your smoking is causing additional cost and consequences on your friends and neighbors. Sadly, the federal government refused uh, would not even enter into conversations with us about a stepped-in program that would be based on personal responsibility and premium assistance. And so, therefore, we check the mail every day to see if the federal government has awakened to the fact that over 20 states have said, no, we don't want to have a failed system expanded. We rather would do something innovative that would actually have a chance to work. Sadly, the federal government hasn't learned that lesson yet, and maybe that's one of the reasons why Obamacare seems to be careening into the ditch. Why do you think the government is, the federal government, is not open to ideas like that? 
Uh, Jeff, I'll, I'll tackle that. First of all, when you look at Medicaid itself, the portion of it that it is a part of the Florida budget has expanded greatly in just the past 10 years. And if we had accepted the Medicaid expansion, it would have put us on an unsustainable path. There's no way we would have been able to afford it once the federal government stopped paying their portion of it, which they said they would. But again, I agree with the delegation here. Um, there's no assurance that they would even be able to do that. So it was taking us on an unsustainable path that we could not go to. The way, best way to fix any system, any market system, is to allow it to have freedom of choice. And as Senator Gates was saying, to have that ability to be able to choose um, for themselves, create that competition, that will naturally lower um, uh, the cost. The federal government doesn't seem to understand that. What they seem to want to do instead is add more controls. They want to add uh, more levers that they can pull and direct people where they want. The problem with that is you can never do it wisely enough to prevent unintended consequences. Anyone else want to add to that? Okay, I think we pretty well covered that. Um, and, and, and I'm sure it's something that's going to be continued to, to be talked about as we move forward here. Uh, no easy answer, no question about that. Um, this, again, a viewer question, and we're kind of switching gears here. Uh, do you think there will be fewer mass shootings if we provide better funding for mental health? And I'll throw that up to whoever wants to tackle it initially. Yes. Uh, I think that obviously in Florida and around the country we've been awakened to the fact that mental health care is really important, not just to the people who need mental health care, but for the community at large. You know, I serve on the Health Care Appropriations Committee along with Representative Hill. Last year there was more funding provided for targeted, evidence-based mental health approaches. We need to continue to do that. Anyone else want to add to that? I mean, every, everyone would agree that that, that that makes sense and that's something that you guys want to try to push as we move forward here. Yes, okay. Certainly. Very good. Um, here's something that ha we've actually got a fair amount of response from uh, this evening, uh, several questions talking about what is going on with uh, fishing and and lionfish. And we were talking about this a little bit prior to going on the uh, air. And uh, the question is budget allocations for artificial reefs. Uh, what's the story there? And lionfish, uh, what are we what are we going to do to stop them? Well, I've learned more about lionfish than I ever thought I could learn. And I still don't know enough. But I can tell you that, uh, uh, first of all, uh, this delegation worked together to ask the uh, the Florida Fish and Wildlife Commission to uh, allow lionfish to be hunted, whereas in the past that really wasn't allowed. And so now lionfish are being hunted. There's no bag limit. And uh, so every year in Destin we have a lionfish tournament, and I guess the person who gets the uh, most lionfish gets some kind of an award that they've named after me. Maybe I look like a lionfish or something. <laughs> uh, so we're after that issue, and, and, and frankly I believe that because lionfish eat the other fish and threaten our fisheries, we need to be even more aggressive uh, th than we have been. Anyone want to add to that? I would add that they are delicious. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff, Jeff, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll say that, that that's so funny. But I'll, I'll say this too, that uh, you know, the state does allocate a certain amount of money toward uh, the eradication of uh, non-native or invasive species. Uh, traditionally, it's been focused on snakes in the Everglades. And it's not always for nefarious reasons that, that these snakes yeah, or, or, or species are released. Uh, I think the, the uh, scenario you likely think of is someone releasing a pet. But it's uh, uh, during Hurricane Andrew, there was a recent research facility that housed, uh, you know, many species of snakes, obviously not native to Florida, but they were released, uh, you know, n not uh, on purpose, but the end result is that they uh, permeated the Everglades. And so uh, we do allocate money uh, in order to, to go after that problem, and lionfish obviously will be uh, a part of that effort. Okay. And Jeff, the other part of your question had to do with, with artificial reefs. I've co-sponsored every bill that's passed the Florida legislature uh, providing for artificial reefs, and my guess is that uh, this year, just like last year, we'll continue to appropriate money for artificial reefs. They help build the fisheries. Uh, they're a real good thing for Florida's economy and for Florida's ecology as well. 
And while we're still on the subject of fish, again, a viewer question. Uh, the red snapper season is closed in the state of Florida. Why is FWC letting uh, just a few people, I guess some researchers, according to this email from, from this gentleman, uh, fish and, and not everyone else? Uh, Jeff, I looked into that a little bit and have found that the uh, NOAA, the National Association of Atmospheric uh, Advisors, um, make the determination of what the red snapper fishing season is going to be in the Gulf. And I think that's a bit flawed, that instead we should look at the local uh, fishers, fishermen who are here, uh, the boat captains, take their input because they're there day in and day out. They see what is happening. And according to them, um, there should be a longer season. Uh, um, their catch limit should be increased. And that's just going to benefit everyone because as they sell those fish to our restaurants, it, it boosts the economy and then uh, making it much more affordable for those who like to go out and enjoy that delectable fish. Well, how can we change that? Well, as uh, Representative Hill indicates, that's uh, unfortunately not totally within the purview of the state of Florida. Uh, the Gulf waters that are federal waters are within the purview of the federal government and federal agencies. So I know that Congressman Sutherland and Congressman Miller have both been working to try to uh, get the federal agencies involved to use proper science and proper research, as Representative Hill has indicated. We've put all the pressure on from Florida, uh, and, and we certainly are on the side of the fishermen in this regard. If you go out fishing, you'll see there's lots and lots of red snapper. Uh, but the problem is we, we're, we're frankly in a fight with a federal agency that has so far been fairly recalcitrant. That's why it's so important to be in touch with our members of Congress about this. So, so your advice to the fishermen would be to take it to the federal level and, and continue to push in that direction? Absolutely. Okay. Let's go from fishing to marijuana. Um, the, again, a question from uh, from a viewer and uh, Representative Gates. I'm going to fire this one at you. Now, uh, this question was uh, asked, do you plan to support a bill allowing medical marijuana? Let me preface prior to us getting into that. It's recently been approved for it to go on the ballot for the voters to decide. So where does it stand from your standpoint? Well, uh, there's all different kinds of strains of marijuana. And what I've learned recently is that there is a strain of marijuana that was developed in Colorado that has no high effect. It doesn't have a euphoric element that gives people the high that street marijuana does, but it does have very high amounts of cannabidiol, which has been proven in some clinical trials at the early stage to reduce the effect of seizures on young children with intractable epilepsy. Just during the course of this program, six children in America will die of intractable epilepsy. It's incurable, and every day these kids have the worst seizure of their life. Mm -hmm. uh, I know Representative Ingram, Senator Gates, Representative Hill, and I have all met with some local families that are affected, and I can say that I'm going to champion legislation this year to get the type of medical marijuana that doesn't get people high, but that can help severely vulnerable children get better. I'm going to champion making that legal because I don't think parents that are trying something to save the lives of their children ought to be criminals. And, and, and I think what you're talking about has been in the press to some degree. I think they call it Charlotte's Web. Or yeah, there was a little girl named Charlotte who was six years old, and she was in a catatonic state. Her parents never got to hear their own daughter say, I love you. And she was on, you know, 15 different kinds of prescription drugs. When she was able to ingest, not smoke, but ingest a paste that contained a portion of this marijuana plant that doesn't get people high, she changed. She now rides bikes. She can talk to her parents. She swings on swing sets. She has friends. She doesn't have a feeding tube anymore. I mean, and when you see the potential in just one child, I mean, you want to replicate that so bad for every parent that suffers. I mean, there are probably many parents of special needs children watching this program, and the parents of special needs children I've met will do anything on earth for their kids. And when they do those things, I don't think they ought to be criminals. Uh, Jeff, I'd like to add to that. First of all, the medical marijuana issue that's on the ballot right now and has been approved by the uh, Florida Supreme Court, I will vote no on that. Um, however, having said that, um, I am for voters having the right to decide um, what they would like to do with their lives. Now, though I would vote no for the medical marijuana as it appears on the ballot, what uh, Representative Gates is talking about, I am a lot more agreeable to looking into. 
Um, I did speak with the parents who came and sat down with me, and I'm one of those parents uh, who had a child with special needs when they were first born, uh, born with a, a heart condition, and I know what that means to be able to say you will do anything to help your child and to be able to have a substance that's available which does not create the high, the euphoria, but can treat them and it's, it's in a, I understand it's in a, a liquid form that can be taken and to relieve that suffering and anxiety, uh, I'm very interested in looking at that and uh, seeing that move forward. Why would you be against, what is it about what's going to be on the ballot in November that you would be against? Well, I agree with um, uh, Attorney General Pam Bondi and Governor Scott that is worded such that um, it would allow the prescription to be given to those uh, for many varied reasons and it could get to the point where we'll have the incidence of these pill mills as we had in the state of Florida before where unscrupulous doctors are prescribing this um, to those who perhaps don't need it or simply want it to obtain that high and we've just won that battle of getting rid of the pill mills we don't need now um, marijuana mills on every corner as we are seeing popping up in Colorado. Well sure, I mean, and, and Jeff, I, I agree with everything Representative Hill said. If this ballot initiative passes, our viewers should, should know the truth and that is that there will be a marijuana dispensary in just about every strip mall in Northwest Florida because the regulations are so lax that anybody can walk into their podiatrist's office, claim they have a stomach ache, and get a prescription for marijuana. And so it, it is essentially the legalization of marijuana in this state if that ballot initiative passes. I think there's a more tailored approach. I think that we can take the most vulnerable among us, give them the care that they need without having a product that is going to be universally available that has such a high potential for abuse. How does it work for the mechanics? So will you continue to pursue it in the legislature to yes. pass a bill? Yeah, I'm going to try to pass a bill this legislative session that targets the most vulnerable and then the substance with the least probability of abuse and try to marry those up. If that happens, it certainly won't take the ballot initiative away from the voters. They'll still have an opportunity to vote, but you won't have a circumstance where people who just want to see marijuana universally available will be able to trot out these severely ill children as the basis for their, their constitutional amendment. Either of you gentlemen like to add to that? Well, just to say that uh, you can probably imagine that the uh, discussions uh, at the Sunday dinner table at the Gates family are, uh, are lively on this issue. Uh, as, uh, as a guy who was a little league coach and a scout master and a just say no to drugs sort of guy all my life, uh, I've had to learn a lot from parents as well as from Representative Gates about this issue. I agree with Mike Hill. I'm going to vote no on the, on the marijuana initiative on the ballot because I don't want all those places in strip malls to become, uh, you know, basically pot shops. But I, uh, I don't want to have just anybody be able to hand out marijuana for any specious reason. And that's what the ballot initiative would do. It hides behind medical marijuana. It really means wholesale marijuana available for almost any reason. But what Matt is talking about, what Representative Gates is talking about, is something entirely different. A strain of marijuana that does not have a euphoric effect and able to help children who are otherwise going to die before they reach their early 20s. And I've got to tell you that I'm opening my eyes, I'm trying to be fair, I'm thinking about that, I'm meeting with parents, I'm talking to medical authorities, and I think Matt makes a great deal of sense. Let me just throw this up. I don't mean to be controversial, and, 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 uh, but there are people out there who are probably saying, well, why not just legalize marijuana? There are those who say it's no worse than drinking whiskey. Uh, tax the heck out of it, and there we go. Jeff, if I may, on that one. First of all, we need a sober workforce in America, If we're going in Florida. If we're going to continue to progress as a state, we need a workforce that is going to be able to get us into the next century with the technology that is there. Here's something else that a lot of people don't quite understand. Um, marijuana is not like alcohol in, in this sense. Alcohol is uh, uh, water soluble. Uh, so it can be dispensed from your body rather quickly. Marijuana, on the other hand, is fat soluble. It stays in your system 
in your fat cells much longer than alcohol does. And it has an effect of building up. So it's, once you begin using it on a frequent basis, the amount that stays within your body increases, making your effectiveness even worse. So it, it's a wrong idea to think that marijuana is just like alcohol, com two completely different effects on your body. Okay. I'd like to praise uh, Matt Gates too. I mean, it's, it's a, such a, a politically charged issue uh, but once you see the clear difference in, in the recreational use of marijuana and, and children like, uh, you know, the, the, the Mosleys or the family that came and, and met with us, uh, once you see that, you obviously want to help them when you know there's potentially help available. And uh, I just wanted to, to thank Matt for, for uh, sort of taking the lead. I mean, it's, it's not a politically uh, uh, e easy position to take, but he, I think he's drawn some, some, uh, some, some boundaries and said, hey, you know, you can uh, look at a strain that has uh, a certain amount of THC, you know, the chemical that, that would uh, create that, the high. And, uh, you know, uh, there are ways statutorily, I think, to, to go about uh, legalizing that particular strain. He's, he's done the, the work to, to uh, identify that, and I just wanted to, to say thanks. While we're kind of on that subject, we just had a uh, viewer uh, email us a question, and the question is, uh, what can you do to slow down or stop the trend of locally independent pharmacies closing their doors and stop the loss of local jobs? Can you do anything to help local independent pharmacies? That's the question. Well, my wife's a pharmacist, so, you know, that's an issue that I take seriously. Uh, I'm not sure. I don't know that it's necessarily government's responsibility uh, to stop certain kinds of businesses from uh, growing or, or stop other kinds of businesses from uh, contracting. I, I'm not sure that's our responsibility. If there's something the government is doing that is affecting pharmacies and forcing them to close, uh, then, then certainly we ought to stop anything that the government is doing in that regard. I think your questioner may be referring to the fact that uh, that there's more pharmaceuticals that are being purchased uh, uh, by mail now and fewer times when you walk in and see your friendly pharmacist behind the counter. Uh, but, you know, I don't know a way to fix that. I don't know a way to pass a law against people buying uh, medications that are properly prescribed through the mail. That might be a little too much government interference. What I've encouraged uh, independent pharmacies to do is develop a, a, a selling a combine, a group of pharmacies that can work together and offer their services and their products to the market at a competitive price. If you can't offer the competitive price, then I think it becomes very difficult, uh, I think at least as a conservative, for the government to step in and subsidize uh, a, a business that can't be competitive. But I think independent pharmacies offer a personal service. I think they offer safety. I, my own pharmacist has told me many times, you can't take this because of the other medications that you're taking. Uh, but I think that they need to work together and develop a selling combine or a selling consortium so they can approach the market in a competitive way. I don't think that government ought to try to pass a law that says that people can't fail in business. Perhaps much of the mail order stuff is being driven by the insurance companies, perhaps. I think so. I think so. Yeah. Uh, another viewer question here. Where do you stand on Article 5 limiting the federal government's power? Who wants to take well, that Well, there's one? legislation before uh, the House and the Senate that would trigger elements of Article 5 that would permit the states to come together and amend the federal constitution uh, for some very specific purposes, most notably a balanced budget, and federal term limits. Those are two concepts that I support. Article 5 has not been triggered uh, since the inception of our country, really, in that way. But I think that these are some pretty remarkable times that we're in. I mean, all the things we're talking about today are very interesting, and I'm sure that our viewers are interested in learning about them. But if we don't do something about the fact that we have a $16, 17000000000000 trillion debt that we're passing on to the next generations, not much of this is going to matter. And so I, I'm a big supporter of the initiative in the House and in the Senate to trigger Article 5, bring the states together, require the federal government to do what we do in Florida, what families do around their own kitchen tables, and balance the budget. And then I think if we can get rid of folks who stay in Washington for 20 and 30 years, I think we'll get more of that just regular, everyday common sense in our nation's capital, and that's a refreshing thing. Anyone want to piggyback on that? 
Well, I agree with Representative Gates 100%. Um, our Constitution says that the power belongs to the states and to the people. And what we're seeing right now is the reverse of that. Too much power is in Washington, D.C. with the federal government, and this Article 5, 5 convention would turn that around and start moving the power back towards the states and the people. And as Representative Gates mentioned, we, Florida, has shown the nation of how you can balance a budget, how you can use conservative principles of limited government, low taxes, personal freedom, and individual responsibility, and do it in such a way that not only can we balance a budget, but we'll be able to give money back to the people. That's how government should operate. Yeah. All right. Jeff, we're, uh, I, it was uh, during the 2012 session I introduced a memorial uh, that would you know, ask Congress to, to uh, balance its budget or you know, pass a, a balanced budget amendment. And from the time that we drew up the, the House Memorial, which is a request to the federal government for whatever particular uh, item you want to talk about, from when we drafted the amendment, uh, I believe that the deficit was at or the, you know, uh, thir $13 uh, trillion. We had to uh, amend that bill just within a couple of months. Had to amend it three times because uh, the, the, the debt had, had uh, continued to uh, accrue. Uh, you know, uh, to, to where it was 16 and, and, and 17 trillion dollars. And so uh, that's just unsustainable. If we don't do something, we won't be here as a country. So I think we all see the need to, to address that. I sent Senator Alan Hayes to Mount Vernon to meet with legislators from other states to develop the legislation that uh, Representative Gates, Representative Hill have both talked about that would uh, call for a convention of the states. Uh, and I'm for it, and I've told Senator Hayes I'll vote for it. There's one caution, and it's the fact is that if there's a convention of states, uh, there's no guarantee that the people who would come from the state of New York or the state of Indiana or the state of South Dakota will necessarily agree with the people coming from the state of Florida. So you can't fear the debate. You've got to be ready to present your ideas. Not everybody at a constitutional convention agrees. If you don't believe me, check the Federalist Papers and look back at, you know, the fierce debates when the Constitution of the United States was created. So not everybody who comes is going to have the same political point of view. There's going to be a lot of fierce debate. Uh, but I believe that now is the time to review the bidding, as uh, Matt has said, and make sure that we can have the kind of federal government uh, that uh, gives us a country that we can turn over the next generation. Uh, because right now, we're turning over a diminished America to the next generation because we won't pay our debts and we won't get the lifetime politicians out of Washington. Okay, very good. Um, let's, speaking of young people, talk about education. And there's been an awful lot of questions come in regarding education. And one of the issues that um, uh, our viewers want to hear about, Common Core, Common Core Standards. And this viewer says we need to get rid of Common Core. The state of Florida needs to make its own decisions regarding education. And uh, it's not what our Constitution says. Now that's, um, I'm, I'm quoting the viewer's question there. Senator Gates, I'm going to start with you, your former superintendent of schools. Your thoughts? Well, first of all, uh, the Common Core issue really breaks down into a couple of things. One is the standards themselves, and the standards are language arts and mathematics. Uh, and, you know, the standards are things like should a child in kindergarten uh, be taught to count to 100? Should we use cursive writing? Uh, should we teach trigonometry? Should we use certain methods to teach it? Uh, there's nothing in the Common Core standards uh, dealing with language arts or, or, or mathematics that have anything to do with uh, some of the concerns, the rightful concerns, that I'm hearing people be concerned about. What they seem to be concerned about are some of the curriculum and instructional materials that the federal government is trying to attach to these high standards. I support any high standards that will allow our students to do better and be more competitive. Call them, count them Common Core, call them Rutabaga. Whatever you call them, if they're higher standards, I'm for it. But the instructional materials and, and the method of teaching by our state constitution is a matter that the state of Florida holds to itself and delegates uh, to a large extent to local school boards. That's why there's legislation in the Senate and in the House 
to make sure that the selection of instructional materials and textbooks is up to the local school board, not up to the federal government, and not even up to the state of Florida. I hope that legislation passes. Then there's the question of assessment and data security. And that's why Speaker Weatherford and I contacted the Department of Education and said we ought not to be part of this national park assessment because the data security was, if anything, highly questionable. And, and also the test itself would have been longer than the FCAT and there was really no firm price tag for it. And so the state of Florida is going out in March and we're selecting whether it's ACT or SAT or Stanford or some other testing service that has a national reputation that our parents have some confidence in uh, that can be used in Florida to give a valid and reliable assessment. So I'm for high standards. I'm for making sure that local government and locally elected school boards select instructional materials, and we've got to make sure we've got valid and reliable assessment, and we have to make sure that we have test security. That's exactly what Governor Scott and the Board of Education are doing right now, and I support it. Anyone would like to add to that? Uh, Jeff, I would only add this. I agree 100% with what Senator Gates just said. I could not say it near as eloquent as he could. There's another small feature of this, though, and that's the actual practicality of implementing what was going to be required by Common Core, and that is each of the students taking these tests and using a computer to do so. So that would require then having each student there in the classroom with a computer, which we don't have right now, but not only that, to have the functional ability to plug each computer in. There's not the electrical network yet to even do that. So to press forward with it before we even ready um, would have been impractical and, and not wise. And I do support everything that Senator Gates mentioned, that essentially Florida is taking this on our own to make sure that we do have the high standards and that our children are going to be graduating uh, with the proper education. And speaking of education and technology, again, a viewer question, and the viewer says, I've heard that the Florida Department of Education is recommending a huge appropriation for technology for K through 12 schools. Um, and, and he or she says, if I heard that correctly, how would those funds uh, essentially be distributed? Would it be based on student populations? And, and he or she goes on and basically says, can we have a little bit more fairness in regards to populations? In other words, it seems Seems like the, the large schools and the large population seems to be getting all the money. Well, that, that viewer may very well be from Santa Rosa County, which is either dead last or second to last in per pupil funding in the state. I used to represent portions of Santa Rosa County, and it was one of my biggest failures in the legislature that I wasn't able to create more equity. Hopefully now that uh, Representative Hill and Representative Broxson have those areas, they'll be able to improve on it. The bottom line is we ought to lash funding, whether it's for the bricks and mortar or technology or instruction to student performance. You know, the, the, the money's got to go where the success is occurring and uh, we need to do a better job as a delegation advocating for our kids who are doing better in the classroom than kids in other parts of the state but they're not receiving the same funds. Okay, very good. Let me switch over and, and talk a little bit about the environment. Again, another question from a viewer. With the surplus, will you fund Florida Forever, Greenways and Trails, or environmental programs that had been cut back? And while we're on that, I also know there's a huge issue surrounding water, and that may be more of an issue downstate than here. Uh, but you guys elaborate, and uh, it's a jump ball. Who wants now, to On the water issue, Everyone in the panhandle of Florida should get very nervous every time you hear our state leaders start talking about statewide water policy. That is a euphemism for we are coming for your water. And right now you don't see a lot of people uh, concerned about that because we live in the panacea of water. I mean, throughout the course of human history, where water is dictates where civilizations are. All we've got to do is dig and we hit it. And so we've been spoiled in that respect, but as there's more usage in other parts of the state, we have to make sure to protect those resources here in the panhandle. Now, Florida Forever, those other pro programs mentioned in the question, I gotta be honest, I get a little nervous when the government starts buying up too much property. And, and I think the Florida Forever uh, goal is a worthy one to protect the environment, but you know, as far as using the power of the government to take money from one person and then buy land for another and to convert that to the government's use, you know, I, I think there are other priorities in the state that 
that are more substantial. Yeah, J J oh, Senator. No, go ahead, please. I, I think Matt's uh, exactly mm -hmm. right, with the exception of I think one one scenario that it makes sense for the state uh, to buy uh, private lands is to buffer our military bases. I think that uh, mm -hmm. when it comes time for the base realignment and closure process, when it gets going again, if we've uh, taken that wise step of, of buying uh, buffered lands around our, our military installations, that will pay off and, and keep our installations in Florida. In the state of Florida and the federal government already own a huge portion of this state. And so the question that one always has to ask is, how much is enough? There's a constitutional amendment that's being proposed by my good friend, Governor Bob Graham, that would uh, mandate uh, $300 million a year be carved out of education, the environment, health care, law enforcement, economic development, and set aside just to buy private land, take it off the tax rolls, and give it to the government. Well, I have to be against Governor Graham's initiative because I think when you provide that kind of a, uh, uh, of a flow of money, of course you're going to create an appetite to just have the government acquire more land. I'd rather look at each transaction one at a time. We passed legislation in the Florida legislature to say, look, we've also got some land that the government owns that has no environmental uh, impact and has no environmental value. And let's try to sell some of that land and use the funds from that to acquire environmentally sensitive land. Let's be smart about it and not just have the government buy more land just because we could pass a constitutional amendment that would force the government to spend money that we could use for other purposes. Um, in, in, anyone want to talk a little bit about uh, some of the surplus maybe going towards different types of environmental programs? I think that was kind of part of the question as well. We got so much money coming to the Panhandle as a result of the Restore Act that is specifically designated for environmental projects. And I'm glad that we have those resources coming to our part of the state, but I don't think when you've got that flow of money coming here for an environmental purpose that we then have to go and take money out of the classrooms and away from infrastructure projects for that purpose. Okay. Uh, another viewer question, many, many viewer questions tonight. We appreciate that. And uh, you still have time at 850-484-1223 or a quick email. Uh, questions at WSRE.org or on the WSRE Facebook page or toll free at 1-800-239-WSRE. Many questions tonight, many good and interesting questions tonight as well. Uh, a viewer question, what can you do to regulate synthetic narcotics such as spice and bath salts and to stay ahead of the new synthetic narcotics. I'll take that, Jeff. Uh, my partner, uh, Representative Gates, who, who chairs the Criminal Justice Committee, uh, we worked together for the past uh, couple of sessions, along with the Attorney General, uh, to ban. Uh, we had to essentially spell out these uh, e each substance, uh, and and there are you know 35 letter uh, names, you know chemical uh, formula names for each of these substances, and so we uh, we we banned a list back in 2011 that started the process of chipping away at the manufacturers and and uh, retailers that sell sold those uh, synthetic drugs. Uh, almost immediately after we banned the drugs, uh, the manufacturers changed the uh, formulas slightly and were back on the streets selling those drugs, uh, you know, once again legally because they, they uh, had, had circumvented the law. And so we uh, partnered with the Attorney General, uh, came up with a, a, a formula where when these new substances uh, come onto the street, uh, she has the ability to issue an emergency order uh, to ban that substance and then uh, when the legislative session rolls around, then we codify that into law. And so that, that's be begun to be very effective. We went from a list of uh, uh, almost uh, too many to count in 2011 uh, down to, to several last year, uh, and I think maybe only three or four additional uh, chemical formulas. Uh, so we are having an effect, but we want to continue to do that. And it's, it's the Attorney General's taking the lead uh, on, on making sure that she stays out ahead of, of uh, that problem. Okay. So, Jeff, what I would like to see with that proper direction that we're going, we know who these manufacturers are who are doing this. And it is our responsibility to provide safely for uh, our citizens. And the sad part about this is that most of these synthetic drugs are being directed towards our children who simply don't know any better. And so we know who those manufacturers are. I would like to see us go after those manufacturers that when they try to make a little change to how they are putting these substances together um, and we know that what their intent is, that we should be able to go after them directly and shut them down. The, the problem is they're in China. 
I mean, the problem is that most of the product that, is, that are bath salts and synthetics that are make their way to the, behind gas station counters are manufactured in China. And Representative Hill is right, though, that organized crime is playing a big part in getting these products uh, into the state of Florida. That's why Representative Ingram last year had legislation that would identify those specific elements of, of organized crime and gang-related activity. And now Florida will be one of the only states in the country where when we get these people, when we finally catch them, as Representative Hill said, we're going to be able to introduce into evidence during the sentencing phase of their trial their participation with organized crime and gangs, and that will elevate their sentences beyond just simple possession. Yeah. Right. And Jeff, there, there is hope federally of, of what's known as an analog statute, which uh, would essentially say if a, a chemical is similar in makeup to one that's already banned, uh, if it has a similar effect on the body's nervous system as to uh, as a formula that's already banned, then it, in, in essence, will also be banned and be illegal. And so that that uh, the, the test case uh, that, that prosecutes that analog statute is, is, is out there in the Tenth Circuit, and hopefully uh, it, that would be sort of the magic bullet that would keep this off the streets forever. And so we, we watch that closely and hope that that, uh, that goes well. I have about seven or eight minutes left, and we're getting a lot of interesting questions this evening. So I'm going to kind of rapid fire here on a couple. Here, here's one that hasn't come up. Uh, I think it's kind of interesting. The uh, viewer says the federal government is passing uh, a law uh, to bypass states trying to require businesses to label their products with uh, GMO, the genetically modified seeds and that sort of thing. Um, uh, what is the state of Florida going to do to protect consumers on the GMO issue? That's becoming a hot topic around the globe these days. Well, I think it's one of the reasons why the Article 5 uh, convention is probably important to prescribe and proscribe uh, the role and powers of the federal government. Uh, you know, I think the federal government probably uh, can make the argument that as these, uh, as these uh, uh, products and uh, across state lines, that it becomes interstate commerce, and therefore it, they can make it a federal issue. Uh, but if it's grown in Florida, if it's produced in Florida, uh, I think that then we have much more control over it. That's why people ought to eat Florida citrus and, you know, Florida products. But uh, that's why it's important to have the Article 5 convention, because otherwise, uh, if the Interstate Commerce Clause is, uh, is invoked by the federal government, there's not a lot we can do. Okay. I'm gonna... Uh, why are you allowing, and, and, and let me answer this for the sake of time because I think we covered this earlier, a, qu a question, why are you allowing uh, 17 head boats uh, or party boats, I guess it says, to fish year-round when charter boats, well, I guess we didn't answer that. Why are you allowing party boats to fish year-round when charter boats can't? Well, we're not. Uh, one of the things that people probably don't understand is that the Fish and Wildlife Commission is a separate constitutional entity, and uh, they're happy to hear from us. Uh, occasionally, we write them letters, we tell them how we feel, but uh, they make their own rules and they're prevent in the Constitution itself sets them up as gubernatorial appointees who have their own operational authority. So the answer to that question is, let us know if you want to go to the next uh, Florida Fish and Wildlife Commission hearing. We'll let you know when it is, where it is, and you can go testify. Okay, fair enough. Uh, will you provide more funding for the arts? Right now, funding for the arts is done through our K through 12 education and even through higher education. And it's always been an important part of our culture, not only in Florida, but across the U.S. So it is important to fund the arts. Now, what we have to be careful of is making sure that it is not taking priorities from such things as uh, premium education, um, health care, uh, our military, and so forth. So we have to be wise about funding the arts. Okay. I want to throw one more question up because this is another interesting one from a viewer. For the 20, uh, I'm assuming maybe he's talking about the 2014 session or 2015 session, can our local delegation pursue passing a bill whereby local constitutional officer elections are nonpartisan races? And he says this should stop some of the games played by write-in candidates, uh, disenfranchising thousands of voters. That's opinion there. But anyway, uh, your thoughts on that? We, we could, but I wouldn't support that. I think that part of the 
partisan process that we have in this country requires people to state what their views are, what their ideology is, what role they think the government ought to have. And I think that if you, if you start to deconstruct that, where people no longer have to articulate an ideology or ascribe themselves to a particular viewpoint, then you simply have beauty contests uh, where you know, folks that are just the most likable get elected rather than people that uh, are able to articulate what they would do if they were elected. So that is something that we could do. I wouldn't support it, though. Okay. have a viewer, and, and I'm going to answer this question. He says, why are there no independents or Democrats on your panel? I'm very dismayed at your choice of one-sided presentations. It represents a real media low that skews the desires of millions. This administration has already tried to disinfect it. Well, the reason why there are no uh, independents or Democrats on this particular panel is because uh, none were elected in the Northwest Florida area for the, and this is the Northwest Florida legislative delegation. So if it's a situation where Democrat or independents elected, we will more than happily roll out the red carpet and uh, have them on the program. So I'll answer that question. Uh, we are very short on time here. I want to ask each one of you to sort of go around the table here and give me what you are optimistic about for 2014. I'd like to end this on, on a little bit of an optimistic note because we, we talked about we are going to have a budget surplus. Things seem to be improving with the economy. Let's talk about what's good out there. Let me start with you, Representative Hill. Well, several good things are happening, particularly in a panhandle. Um, we have a strong military presence here, which we want to protect, that we want to make sure remains viable. We have um, just a beautiful environment here, and just recently, Secretary Vineyard made an announcement that because of uh, BP money, Restore Act money, that we're going to do be doing things to make the uh, area even more uh, environmentally beautiful, um, planting seagrasses and plants and so forth. And that's only the first step. The, the other part of that money, and thanks to Senator Gates, who had legislation passed that said that the vast majority of that uh, BP money must go to the eight counties that were affected the most and it's going to be our responsibility to come up with business plans to use that money wisely to make sure that our economy in this area grows and prospers and makes it a place such that families can stay together and what i mean by that if we have our economy growing so that our children can stay in this area and continue to thrive and prosper and not have to move somewhere else that keeps families together. We've got about two minutes, Representative Gates, in 30 seconds. <laughs> when I was elected in 2010, the state was on the rocks. I mean, people were leaving Florida, enrollment was down in our schools, and, and the budget was in shambles. A thousand people a day are moving to Florida this year, Jeff. And you know what? If we don't screw anything up too bad in the government, that's going to raise uh, a lot of opportunity for everybody, and that's what I'm excited about. Florida is a place where people want to be again, and that's exciting. Representative Ingram. Yeah, Jeff, taxes are lower. Uh, you know, I think it's fair to say thousands of regulations have been repealed. Uh, uh, we have a budget surplus, all based on the fact that we made tough decisions uh, in, you know, in, in past years. We didn't raise taxes. Uh, we decreased decrease regulations. Uh, the, the future's bright, and we're going to continue on that trend this year, and I think, you know, uh, Florida has a bright future. I know nationwide we fight uh, federal problems, but, but here we are in, in Florida, and it's uh, one of those little bastions of freedom uh, that, that we're going to continue to, to grow. Senate President Don Gates in 30 seconds. I think the road to the future runs right through northwest Florida because of the Restore Act funds, because of the, fa the educated workforce we have, because of the low taxes, because we have local governments uh, that want businesses to grow and want to encourage it. I think we have all the ingredients. Now if we can build a transportation infrastructure and an energy infrastructure and begin to attract the mid-tech and high-tech employers that can diversify our economy, the next 10 years will be the best 10 years in Northwest Florida's history. A lot to be excited about, in other words. I think so. All Absolutely. right. Sounds good. Gentlemen, thank you so very much. We have some wonderful questions this evening. Great response. Uh, very robust response from our viewers, and we certainly appreciate that. We thank uh, the gentleman for joining us this evening, and we thank you for watching. We wish our legislators all the very best in the 2014 legislative session. Our guests from Northwest Florida have been the, le the I should say, our Northwest Florida legislative delegation guests have been Senate President Don Gates, Representative Clay Ingram, along with Mike Hill and Matt Gates. I'm Jeff Weeks. Thank you so very much for watching Legislative Review 2014 Dialogue with the Delegation. Have a safe and wonderful weekend. We'll see you soon. Good night.